Hi, everyone. Welcome to the SAEM Research Learning Series course online lecture titled A Framework for Artificial Intelligence in the Emergency Department. As we begin today, please write down and save any questions you may have for the end of the presentation. You can either enter them into the chat box or unmute yourself during the Q&A portion of the lecture. This presentation is being recorded and will be available shortly following today's session. And now it is my pleasure to introduce to you, Dr. Maya Yadam. Dr. Yadam is an Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine at Stanford University and researcher with expertise in emergency care clinical operations and timely emergency care delivery. She was first trained in healthcare policy in Princeton University's School of Public and International Affairs. She subsequently worked as a healthcare industry management consultant in New York City for CSC Global Health Solutions Group and was the Dean's Office Chief of Staff at Drexel Medical School in Philadelphia. She completed her medical education at Robert Wood Johnson Medical School, a master's in public health at Harvard with additional health policy training from Johns Hopkins. She subsequently did residency at Mass General and Brigham, and Brigham Women's Hospital's Harvard affiliated program and completed a Master of Science in Clinical Investigation at Vanderbilt University. Dr. Yadam is the Principal Investigator for the Stanford Emergency Care Health Services Research Data Coordinating Center. Current work includes refining clinical process, using informatics to support evidence-based practice, and performance measurement to identify real-world care improvement opportunities. Her research is supported by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute and ED Bench Marking Alliance. She is the founding director of the Emergency Department Operations Study Group and on the board of directors for the Emergency Department Bench Marking Alliance. Dr. Yadam, I will now turn it over to you. Thank you, John. That was a really generous introduction and I I have to say that I'm really thrilled to be able to participate in the research learning series here with SAEM. Um, specifically today, I'll talk about a framework for artificial intelligence and emergency medicine. And before I'll hop in, I'll tell you a little bit about my journey to my current role that has me engaged in the implementation of artificial intelligence or AI within our clinical practice. So I've had experience working in over 11 emergency departments where I've observed clinical practice variation, operations practice patterns that are common to all of us, but also ways, as I've mentioned, the variation where they're different. I became really interested in comparing administrative practices and policies and guidelines across emergency departments via work with three national benchmarking organizations. And then segued uh, my administrative interest into clinical operations research and uh, spent a lot of time identifying what electronic health record data is available at critical points in care processes that we, where we need data to support decision-making in ways that enhance the timeliness of care. And that real critical component, the timeliness of clinical care is so integral to emergency medicine, yet presents a challenge for the integration of artificial intelligence that really is not really, is unmatched in other clinical disciplines. Um, what I've spent a lot of time doing recently is learning how to use that data to develop decision support tools that can replicate physician decision-making when a physician isn't available or is otherwise occupied, and also enhancing patient outcomes by automating activities that are prone to human error. And so I will say that, um, you know, when most people talk about artificial intelligence, um, you know, we think about the tech, tech companies, and um, John and I were just on the line talking about how, you know, our phones listening to us is the mic that's, you know, facilitating the Zoom call. Um, constantly collecting data on me and learning about my habits in order to feed things back to guide and inform what I might do in the future. Um, well, I'll say, you know, in medicine, when we think about the application of AI and how that could be mirrored in medicine, I think most of us um, can sometimes think about, is there, are we talking about a sentient being that's been programmed to capture the knowledge that we've acquired from years of study, 
the experience that we've gained at the bedside from all the patients that we've seen throughout the course of our career, and then also lessons that we've learned from successes and failures, and, and somehow pull that all together and be me, or be you, or be us. Well, I think all of us look at this, we have an air of excitement about what this is or what this could be, but have a little bit of skepticism that our practice, which is much science, but also part art, can be replicated in quite this way. So uh, I will reassure you that the sentient being takeover of emergency medicine is light years away. However, um, I do think that there are still ample opportunities for really basic concepts of artificial intelligence to be planted and seed how we can innovate and think creatively about how to improve our practice, how it impacts our patients and how we drive better outcomes in ways that are difficult to do with just basic human interactions between a doctor and their patient. And so there are ways to do this where um, AI won't compete with physician's expertise. I think we often think of it as replacing us. There are no bots that are gonna replace the docs. Um, but what it can do is offload the mental load of consistently replicating a decision that we've all decided we want to have accomplished a certain way. It can, all, it can offer the opportunity to introduce complex physician-like decision-making into phases in care where physician's involvement isn't optimal for various reasons um, or cost-effective. And then lastly, in many of these ways, it's being introduced in a way that supports human performance. Is it replacing human performance? Is it acting instead of human performance, but supports human performance within a pathway or process of care that's pretty standardized, or at least there's a rubric or a logic for how we approach it. Um, so in this way, uh, what I'll talk about in the context of this framework is really how to think about artificial intelligence augmenting human performance. So taking what we know and understand and believe should be the way we practice all the time and helping a computing system, um, having a computing system help us to achieve our targeted performance. We'll talk a little bit more about this. Now, I will say this image I have on the screen kind of illustrates the concept with the computer hand or the digital hand shaking the human hand. But what I think this is probably more like is a human hand being lifted up by a computing technology. So augmenting the level of the work that we can do as individuals by having that lift to help us hit the right button on the dash uh, at the right height, at the right level, with the right amount of pressure every single time. And so let's dig into this. And so in looking at this framework, I'm going to ask you to sort of wipe away this, the bot takeover, wipe, wipe away the idea of sentient beings, and really just focus on AI being the use of computer systems to perform tasks that normally require human thinking, calculation, and action. Really simple. And then we're going to grow from there. And so there are four critical steps in thinking about how we mature um, an evidence-based driven approach to integrating AI into clinical emergency medicine. So first we have to really understand the decision. And this is really wrapping lots of methodological approaches around understanding where it is that we want to target or introduce artificial intelligence. And so this is a realm where I would say evidence-based medicine really adds strength. The idea that we understand we're in care, there's a challenge, we understand that there's a decision to be made, that there are many different options for what can be done. Now, when I trained in medical school, and this was not that long ago, but when I trained in medical school, that was just at the end of the wave of evidence-based medicine becoming a thing. The idea that you know, many of physicians that were our senior physicians that were with us on the board had grown accustomed to a practice over the majority of their career where they did what was comfortable for them from their experience and their practice and their comfort and their environment for their patients. And now there was a new way of looking at medicine where we were actually synthesizing data from large amount of patients under controlled environments in order to reduce the influence of confounders to help us see whether one decision pathway versus another decision pathway was better or worse. And in doing that, come to some common understanding of what's the right way to treat pneumonia or the right way to treat sepsis or at least approaching sepsis. What's the best way to step a patient through an experience of having a heart attack to get them to definitive intervention and a better outcome? And often it requires coordination that we need to have a good sense of what happened first to be able to initiate what happens next. And I think our medical practice has moved in this direction where we're not really doing cookbook medicine, we're actually doing evidence-informed medicine in order to make sure that patients are exposed to the best practice in order to give them the opportunity for the best outcome. That whole body of work allows us to understand the decision being made in the context of what the best options are. And with those options, we want to implement it consistently in order to give our patients the best access. We really have the ability to step forward and introduce what's learned at that step 
from understanding the decision into our practice. The second step is really now that we've synthesized that knowledge and understood the problem, it's coming up with that logic model, that common way of thinking about what should be done. So this is often an algorithm that replaces the thinking of, that can also incorporate style and um, practice variation that isn't based on um, what is best, but could be just based on physician or system preferences. So really replicating this systemized thinking that we're using to make a decision using available data. So what's really critical is that in developing a logic model, it's not only the right thing to do or how to understand the right thing to do for a patient, but considering what you do and don't know in that moment. And so it may be that if you happen to find out that having a third cousin with congestive heart failure is a predictor of having um, a heart attack in the ED, that is great, but we have no way of uh, reconstructing people's family trees effectively or consistently upon arrival. So even though that data might be predictive, it isn't particularly helpful. And so often where the evidence has to focus is on what we know at that moment and how can we use what we know and what we have at that moment to drive a logic model that can help us make an informed decision. That's really a second level of work. None of this is new. We are pretty familiar with this, which is really the next wave that grew out of evidence-based medicine is creating decision rules in clinical pathways, whether it's for whether when we get a head CT or whether they get an X-ray of a knee or how to, how to score patients in a way to assess whether or not it's okay to discharge them or admit them after an evaluation for acute coronary syndrome in the emergency department. So once we have a logic model um, around how to make a decision, the next step is to in, introduce uh, a computer into the picture and uh, really having it use the data that's available that we learned about as driving our logic model to use a logic model to help us make a decision. And so this is where we transition from evidence-based medicine to decision rules and clinical pathways and move into the realm of using decision rule calculators to help us get focused information to inform a decision. Now this is, we have MedCalc, we have other calculators that are around to us. We have scores that we use in our clinical practice. And many of them historically were on a website where you could go and say, hey, I wanna use this calculator to help inform my decision. You then go there, you enter in information manually that you have from your care encounter, and it provides you with some sort of synthesis to help you guide whether you're gonna go left or right, up or down, or initiate a medication or not. Um, and that output is helpful um, but you have to go to it, you have to enter the information, and then you have to then take it back and implement it. Now, um, it's great to have the calculation automated, but what can even be more helpful is to move that from a website outside of, say, your electronic health record system and embed it into the system. And this is where a lot of emergency departments are innovating, is actually embedding those calculations, the heart score, um, the EDOC, the NEOC score, all sorts of scores into the EHR that are auto-calculated and providing with that information to help inform what you plan to do. Um, where our next frontier is, because all the three steps I've mentioned so far, are it's a journey that we've done throughout my medical career. We moved from evidence-based medicine to decision rules and clinical pathways to using those decision, uh, decision rules in the context of calculators that have become very common for us to do in our practice. Now where we are is really letting a computer initiate action based on the outcome. Most of our electronic health record systems will not let the system generate an order. It requires a human to take that next step. But I would say that this is really the next frontier of finding opportunities to embed, uh, so opportunities to let go and find decisions that can be made by, the by a computer, by our electronic health record systems to augment our practice. So that's our challenge. And so where I'd say the opportunity for this is, is not in trying to decide whether or not um, I should give a medication or not, but really in the realm of um, what I like to call, you cannot leave the emergency department without. So just a few examples to kind of get you thinking in this direction. So you have a patient who comes in with a chief complaint of um, chest pain, and they have a history of coronary artery disease uh, or myocardial infarction. And I think we can all probably agree that this, well, whoever this patient is, is not leaving the emergency department without a common set of labs that likely include a troponin without imaging of some sort that probably includes an x-ray, without an EKG, and probably if there's a bed type option to get a bed as opposed to a chair. So I don't think there are many of us that would disagree with that. Similarly, if we have a vaginal bleeding um, in a patient, a female patient of reproductive age, I think we'd all agree that there's a common set of labs, likely including an HCG quant or at least a pregnancy test, that you prefer to have a bed with stirrups, and if not stirrups, then a bedpan, so you can get a good public exam. 
uh, and a room type likely with a closing or sliding door or a hallway bed and being able to move into a procedure room or at least temporarily into a room for an exam. So the logistics of that are going to be part of what this patient that we don't know their name, we don't know their age, other than that their reproductive age. Um, but we know enough to know that they're going to need a common set of resources that they're not leaving the emergency department without. So what if future patients, we can figure out certain cohorts of patients where future patients that look just like them didn't have to wait for a physician to put orders in. And what if we looked at all patients with those presentations and examined what initial labs and tests they have historically received to start care, uh, and then just automated them and had the role of triage nursing to discontinue modified orders. I mean, I think many of us will say we've, we've moved into the realm of allowing orders to be initiated prior to a physician encounter with this concept of not leaving the emergency department without. And I've empowered our nurse colleagues to do this before seeing one of us. But I think there's an opportunity to take it even a step further where experienced nurses can actually modify orders that automatically happen to get start care started that are based on historical practices, historical trends of you're not leaving the emergency department without. And so I'll give you an example from some of how this can really play out and move forward from through all four steps of this framework that I illustrated where we're really looking for artificial intelligence to augment the care that we practice. Uh, as many of you might imagine, there are opportunities where we might forget to get the HCG or even the urine sample. And for those of you involved in clinical operations work, we all know how difficult it is to get urine in a timely fashion. And it's the one lab test that often takes forever to get because when you want it, you just lost it because somebody had to use the restroom. And then when you finally had the opportunity to get it again, it could really prolong the length of stay. So protocols like this that recognize that and can initiate care consistently at the beginning without having to be exposed to the opportunity for one of us to just miss a click or miss an order or miss the opportunity to mention that we want something to take this out of the picture and make it an auto, a more automated process can really move us forward with the consistency of our care practice. But it has to be really carefully done. And so um, I'll present this example that sort of steps through this from my work and uh, we can look at other areas where the same methodology and the same steps moving forward are played out. Uh, I also mention a few techniques that are often mentioned or used in this work to facilitate, facilitate the process of gathering the right data at the right time and implementing algorithms. So um, a lot of the work that I do has to do with heart attacks, specifically STEMI. Um, and as, that, as we all know, there's dual EKG in 10 minutes with the idea of in order to have the opportunity to treat a STEMI within the window within which uh, our intervention for treatment works. So it's a limited time window for intervention. So we have to really move up the window of time where making the diagnosis is effective. And so we know we have this door to EKG window of 10 minutes. This is evidence-based medicine. There's been work done to demonstrate this pathway is effective. We wanna try and achieve these metrics for all of our patients. We've done a lot of work between pre-hospital care systems, emergency medicine, and cardiology, along with critical care and general floor care to map the process of care for each of these patients. Uh, we understand the activities that happen at each step. So in fact, my group has done some work parceling out pre, um, referred patients, EMS identified patients, and emergency department diagnosed patients, realizing they have the same steps in their care just performed by different um, operators or providers, if you will. Um, and that's important work that helps us to understand the flow that these patients have to, to our system to move from diagnosis to treatment. So we understand the agents for all the activities happening at each of these steps. In addition to that, there have been established practice standards for decades. We have national, we've had national guidelines for over 30 years, hospital quality metrics for over 20 years. We train physicians and nurses for triage with you know, a common knowledge for how this should work. And there are decades of research on risk factors for acute coronary syndrome, presenting symptoms for ED patients found to have STEMI or non-STEMI ACS, really the whole spectrum of ACS that could potentially be STEMI that we're looking for upon arrival with this EKG done within 10 minutes, ideally. Um, and so you know, we've also, in looking at the process, have understood the environment in which this decision has been made. So I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but to kind of illustrate the, what this is and sort of break down how we would insert artificial intelligence, just bear with me and we'll walk through this. And so we have patients arriving via front door, back door. They're coming in, walking in, via a private car, but coming in via ambulance through the back door. And either way, either entry point, what's happening is we're trying to get that EKG in 10 minutes. 
Now, if that EKG, that EKG, the test is done before a doctor has ordered the test, it's performed, it's then taken to a physician. And if that EKG looks like it could potentially be steady, or the patient jumps to for physician evaluation. So in most of our EDs, door to doctor time, median of about 60 minutes, we're not waiting for that for STEMI. The doc then goes to the patient who's jumped queue for a test before actually having a physician encounter. If that EKG is concerning, cath lab's activated, patient's transported to the cath lab ideally or PCI or um, thrombolysis, depending on the location. But for this path, we will focus on PCI. Um, and the goal is to have intervention accomplished within 90 minutes. That is a Herculean effort to go from pre-hospital, pre-arrival to getting a test before the doc, to having the doc retrofit an evaluation, activating a consulting service to then intervene within 90 minute window of time. Um, but we do it and we do it more often than not. Um, however, we don't do it consistently enough for all patients. And that's where this work can really have value. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. So getting that door to EKG is critical because you can't hit this 90 minute mark if you're getting the EKG after a door to doctor or door to provider time of 60 minutes you're not leaving a lot of room to get to 90 minutes. And that's just the median. So we have plenty of patients who are waiting much longer than that before they encounter us. So um, how do you then assure that all patients who need to be here get this EKG within 10 minutes? It's not easy work. And despite the fact that we get it right on average, we don't get it right for everyone. So what's the challenge? Why can't we do this for everyone? Well, when you look at what it happens in the first 10 minutes of an emergency department stay, it's not really speaking to us. So you can see here, ED intake really consumes the first minute, first 10 minutes of those depart, emergency department stays. So even if we took the physician and nursing teams and brought them into triage, which we've done in many places, nurses are already there and docs or physicians in triage are being introduced into the space at different times a day, maybe all the time in different ways in different places, that even that's not early enough because you would need to encounter the patient early in this window of time, that first 10 minutes in order to get the EKG to then inform what happens later on. So if we're waiting, um, here, ready to diagnose the STEMI, ready to know the reasons why we should get an EKG, we've already lost the game because the window closed here of really getting that 10 minute target. So we did some work to try and understand, you know, what is it that we know about patients when they walk into the emergency department and what is it that drives our decision to get an early EKG? And oftentimes what we're really looking at is what we know most reliably, which are chief complaints. What is it that's bringing you into the emergency department today? Well, we looked at chief complaints that STEMI patients have presented with over a three-year window of time at all the centers you see here listed on the left. And this is the hierarchy of what we uncovered. Chest pain, which is the hallmark symptom for STEMI, uh, for ACS, for 71% uh, or 72% of the time, it was right on target. Most patients that have a heart attack that have STEMI in particular have chest pain. And if you look at the subsequent symptoms like rank number two, three, and four, it's shortness of breath, syncope, and cardiac arrest. Now, what's challenging about this is that most patients who are going to have cardiac arrest, most patients with syncope, and most patients with shortness of breath are not going to have STEMI. The incidence of STEMI is incredibly low. It's 0 0.0001, um, which is basically one out of every thousand patients that walks into your emergency department will have a STEMI. And so if you just use this alone, we're trying to get a lot of EKGs in order to find those few patients with STEMIs. And so if you're trying to be parsimonious, it makes a lot of sense to just use chest pain. But the consequence of that is that you're systematically excluding patients who are going to present with these other symptoms. Um, so the, the natural logical next step is can we use other information in order to make better decisions? Um, and also, what's the consequence of missing the patients who are presenting with these other symptoms? Are they different than this group? So we decided to do that work too, to better understand the decision, the context in which it's being made, and the impact of the decision um, at least the way it's currently being done. And so we looked at how the current screening criteria is working for us. Here's one that uses symptoms, but also incorporates age to get a little bit more robust than just using symptoms. And when we play that out, where we saw this criteria being applied to identify patients with STEMI before arrival, before encounter with the physician, that that screening led to, and compared that amongst the population of patients with STEMI, that screening in uh, of 68,000 patients led to 13,000 EKGs being done. And at the end of the day, we had 85 patients with STEMI of whom 25 did not get their EKG within 10 minutes using this. And so that, was, that left us with a sensitivity of about 71%. Um, specificity was 81%, um, but you can see the positive predictive value, the precision of this decision 
is really, really low because we're doing a lot of tests, a lot of false negatives, and we're going to capture a small number of patients, and we're still not getting all of those who have the targeted condition. So this really indicates there's room for improvement, even when we added a little bit more to chief complaints. Um, it just isn't hitting the mark. Um, and so our, what we decided to do was then look at, well, how does this impact patients? And so um, first, we decided to look at all patients with STEMI and see how many, what proportion didn't have their EKG. This time we looked at 15 minutes and said, well, if there's a problem past 15 minutes, we know we're, we're missing the mark and found out that 13% of patients missed screening, missed that early EKG at 10 minutes. And um, that range across EDs was 3.4% to 32.6% of patients with STEMI. Uh, and then looked to see, well, okay, they missed getting the EKG in 10 minutes, but when they finally did get their EKG, how much more time had gone by? And what we saw here was 15 to 80 minutes of additional myocardial ischemia time. So clearly the way we're making the decision now um, has room for improvement and we're systematically missing some patients. So perhaps using a more refined criteria could be helpful. Um, because there's a, there's a clinical impact for those who are not falling into the typical rubric that's being used. Well, we also wanted to see to what degree um, are, is screening standardized? We're talking about consistently applying screening. So we did a survey of 62 emergency departments of various types, academic, non-academic, small, large, different regions of the country, and found that 15% did not have formal study screening criteria, unlike the previous um, analysis that we had done. And in addition, 14% of those sites were using chest pain as the sole criteria. And so that's about 30% of EDs that had inadequate screening or at least screening that could benefit from improvement, um, both in consistency uh, and then also considering uh, overcoming the systematic uh, exclusion of certain patients that didn't present with the classical symptoms. And so we really needed to look into is just adding more better. So we're saying go beyond chest pain. Um, and maybe even go beyond um, just considering chief complaint. And as I showed before, consider age. And just those um, three things um, can actually get us even better performance. What we saw is that we had three models, one using chest pain, one using chest pain and other ACS chief complaints, and a third using chest pain, other ACS chief complaints, and age. And as you can see here, the area under the curves, our ability to discriminate between those who did and didn't have um, uh, in this case, acute coronary syndrome, in order to identify those with STEMI, that moving from model A to model B to model C enabled us to, to significantly increase our ability to discriminate between those who did and didn't have the condition we were for. And as you can see here, the sensitivity went up. We used chest pain and other ACF chief complaints, but the specificity went down significantly. That's generating a lot of false positives. And so by adding an age, we're able to balance that out better, but clearly the sensitivity is still not great. Now, if you'll recall, um, the previous study that I showed, we had chest pain and other ACS chief complaints in age and algorithm. We saw that it performed with about 71% sensitivity. And this, when we objectively applied this criteria to a data set of all the same patients, we found that um, we achieved sensitivity of 83%. So this suggests that automation, just objectively applying the criteria to each patient, performs better than how our screening criteria are used in usual care practice. So this automation representing a computer doing it versus clinical practice, which are humans doing it. There's a difference and computing seems to be doing better. So this suggests that introducing automation could be beneficial. So we decided to really focus in on the 10 minute mark and also try to understand why nationally our metrics look good. It looks like everybody's hitting that 10 minute mark, but what we realized is nationally we're following medians so medians are the 50th percentile, which means half your patients are above and half your patients are below. And when we look specifically across 10 centers, 10 emergency departments, high performing places, great people, great dots, um, and looked at that 10 minute mark to see how many patients were above that mark, it was 37% of STEMI patients did not get their EKG in 10 minutes. So now we're talking about 10. So that's a lot of patients. It's a large minority of patients that are not getting evidence-based care that when we get the diagnosis in 10 minutes, we know it's associated with better outcomes. So, and if we see that we perform better with the automation using the same data that was available um, during live care, that we're able to target a better hit rate. Um, if we could introduce an objective way of doing this in that early time of arrival before 10 minutes, we might be able to bring these patients down below this line, down below 10 minutes. And so, um, 
we found out that this also matters when we look at intervention time because patients who did get their EKG on time um, had shorter door to cath lab arrival and door to balloon time. So that seemed to indicate this was something that if we were able to implement to bring those patients down, it would have an impact on um, intervention times for PCI that have already been identified to have an association with improved um, clinical outcomes. And so we looked back at what data we had available at the time of the decision was made. So now we know we have a decision to make to get an EKG or not, that it happens before there's a physician connection with the patient, that we that's our practice standard. We're also now looking at the idea that if we're able to make that decision more accurately and patients who have the condition we're looking for, we can actually impact the care of about 37% of them. This is huge. So we spent a lot of time looking at what we know about patients in that 10 minute window. It's the first 10 minutes of being in the emergency department, we don't know a lot about them, but we're finding out that we actually do. So as I mentioned, we have chief complaint, we have age, so chief complaint and date of birth. We also have gender, race, language, and the registration scenario. And all of these elements are captured and documented in order to generate the electronic encounter that floats with a patient through their e-visit that we use to document, provide orders, or in, in, to, um, to make orders, to order x-rays, EKGs, lab tests, et cetera. So that's really tracking the patient throughout. So in order to initiate that, we know quite a bit about this per a particular patient. And so in this particular scenario, you can see there's an opportunity for artificial intelligence. First, we have a process target for a physician level decision to be made. Do we get that EKG for this patient or not? Do they have adequate risk for the condition we're looking for? We also have a logic model, and I would suggest um, an opportunity to improve our existing logic model in order to get better outcomes. And thirdly, we've captured or I've identified the data that's ideal for decision making in an electronic health record. So the next step, the new, the next frontier, the opportunity where we can actually transition what we know from evidence-based medicine and the logic model and also the calculation of how we should make that decision into something more automated is having using clinical decision support tools that are part of many of our modern electronic health record systems and programming, programming them to use available data to help the computer, the EHR, make the decision reliably in order to augment our performance. And so we're back to this question of what actions are we letting, are willing to let a computer initiate? And so let's dig into this a little bit more because I, I think we have one here. And so the work that I'm currently doing with my team is to look at this information that we have about patients and to use it in a predictive model, um, an analytical model that would run using registration intake data in order to identify those who need an early EKG. Um, with that determination, when it's a yes, um, it would generate an alert on the screen of the registration clerk who's not a clinician, but they're at the right point at the right time interfacing with the patient to make this call but not the person who should be making the calls. There's a skill to, there's a task a skill set mismatch that um, a predictive physician-like thinking algorithm can help to overcome. So it would generate an alert um, to, on the screen, it would page a tech to come and meet the patient and would prompt uh, a physician order for the EKG that would be carried up by nurse. And so um, just sort of to share how we're operationalizing this, I'll sort of speak about two things, um, predictive modeling analytics, and then also how we're using that to drive decision support. So let's start with the first, predictive modeling analytics. So really there, there are two approaches to doing this. Um, and I'll highlight how we're stepping into it here. So as I mentioned, we have the decision um, and we have an algorithm we're currently working with but looking to improve it. We have a logic model. Um, and so that we're implementing using predictive analytics in the context of a computer in order to interface with when the users are connecting with a patient and entering data to give them an electronic existence to carry through their visit and using what we learn in that interface in order to drive the decision between who gets an early EKG that, that, um, that ends up popping up an alert, paging a tech and ordering EKG, and then who is okay to wait for care. And so really these patients are jumping queue for that test. There are two tools, I'm gonna to pause for a moment and talk about two tools that can be helpful in making this transition from decision to logic model, logic model to computer generated um, guidance, and then that guidance to initiating action. And this are, it's really natural language processing and also machine learning. So let's talk about those for just a moment. And so what we found out was that about 60 to 75% of patients at all of our centers have an existing electronic medical record within the computing electronic health record system at each site. So um, 
And when, so what ends up happening is that if we have a new ED encounter within the, elect, within the existing medical record, we're, we'll enter in demographic information and generate a new encounter, but if there's already one, it actually pulls from that record to arrive at the patient. So we get the benefit of what's already known about them and then the opportunity to verify it as well. So knowing that that many patients actually have more information available, we realize that this offers the opportunity to use more data because we actually know more about patients within the first 10 minutes or at least 60 to 75% of them than just their registration intake data. And there's already an existing connection between the registration process and the existing medical record. And so let's say we had a logic model that's for an ECG for patients with a chief complaint of chest pain. And it was that we wanna get an ECG for patients with a chief complaint of chest pain um, or shortness of breath with an age greater than 30 and a history of CAD or MI. Not saying this is the algorithm, but let's say this was the algorithm. Now you can see that we have chest pain, shortness of breath, those are symptoms, we collect that. We have age, we also collect that for ED arrival. Um, but where it gets tricky is a history of CAD or MI. So this gets into the question of, is this information that we know at this point in care? And generally I'd say no, but if we can link to the existing medical record, we can use some of these other analytical tools to help us get at this information in a way that overcomes the, the fact that the person who's interfacing with the patient is not a clinician and not there to have a clinical evaluation. It's not gonna ask about past medical history. So say you wanted to find out about a history of CAD or MI, you can use natural language processing. And what this is, is it involves programming computer algorithms to process and analyze large amounts of data to find valuable concepts or text that can be used for analysis. So just to illustrate this a little bit more specifically here, NLP or natural language processing requires coding desired concepts into a likely form that it will be present in the EHR. And this takes a bit of work to figure out how it will be presented in a way that's what you're looking for. It might actually be present, but it's saying the opposite of what you want. Um, but for example, what we could do is say, if we wanted a history of CAD or MI, we would, we could say, okay, look for the term CAD or MI as it's present as an ICD code within a diagnosis field in the medical record. Or you could say, look for the terms coronary artery disease, ischemic cardiomyopathy, myocardial infarction, non, non ST elevation myocardial infarction, STEMI, unstable angina, coronary occlusion within an ED clinic or hospital note diagnosis field. And you can imagine you might find it within the context of an HPI, but it could say patient does not have CAD. You can actually program that in too to look at the words that are just before it that have exclusion type language in order to not include CAD in that context. So that is a tool that can be used to dig into large, vast records uh, in a scenario like this to get more information that you might actually have from the human interaction to inform a much more complex decision. And so we talked about natural language processing. The second tool that can be introduced here is machine learning. So this is a term that's very hot. Everybody's talking about it, wants to do it, wants to make it part of what they're doing, so I'll tell you how. Um, and so uh, machine learning is a really helpful tool. Um, in our work, we're juxtaposing it with our, some of our traditional mathematical methods that we use in evidence-based medicine to understand how certain things we know can, can predict things we're looking to understand in the future. So um, that's really the statistical inference approach with regression modeling. The other side is machine learning and they have parallel ways of it being effective and helpful, but they actually operate very generally in an almost an inverse fashion. So we'll talk about that. And so we're using both of these approaches to learn about what can be predictive, understanding what we know, uh, what we're using is just what we know within 10 minutes in order to drive clinical decision support in the electronic health record that again, helps us figure out maybe we should get an early EKG versus who's okay to, to wait in the waiting room. And so um, on the statistical inference side, we use our experience to decide what's likely to be predictive of our targeted outcome. And then we generate a mathematical model, we create a mathematical model that, that, that judgment, those ideas that we think will be predictive are put in. And then we test how well it did. And it tells us the sensitivity and specificity of what we thought would be effective. The way machine learning works is actually you tell the model how well you want it to perform. Say, I want it, you to be 95% sensitive and have 90% specificity. And then you give it a data set of lots of different information about patients, which we'll call features or variables. And it maps out the targeted outcome by calculating backwards relationships of, with those features that are predictive and often is able to identify things that we would have not necessarily thought were predictive based on our clinical knowledge. So it finds out what's predictive after you tell it how you want to perform versus statistical inference where we tell it what we think is predictive and it tells us how well that performed. 
what's tricky about machine learning is that some of these approaches are what folks will call black box. And so it's so complex, it's not gonna give you a list of what well, we found heart rate to be predictive, what we found hair color to be predictive, we found mode of arrival to be predictive. It actually is so complex, it can't show you how it made the decision, which makes it really tricky for advancing our knowledge based on machine learning um, techniques. But there are exceptions in this space that actually are more transparent that can at least let you know what some of the top predictive features were. And that can actually influence further work done with statistical inferencing, if not be used in and of itself. And um, many electronic health systems have additional ways of being able to incorporate predictive models. Some you know, pay for extra features for the bells and whistles. Others can be used in most of the packages and the particular EHR that we work most closely with is Epic, um, not promoting that brand, but just um, sharing the familiarity we have with that particular system. And so the way that we are taking this sort of two-tiered approach is saying, we know we collect and we encounter that interface between a registration clerk or person, a person who's arriving a patient and the patient themselves is that we collect certain data pretty consistently across emergency departments. And we have a prediction from that level, but we also have historical data for about 60 to 75% of patients. And those for whom we have additional data, we like to combine the, what's understood for those two levels of prediction into one ultimate prediction. And so what we have is a two-tier predictive um, model where um, the one tier applies to everyone and that drives sort of whether or not we think they should get an EKG. But the second tier we have for only certain patients, it's a subset. But when we do have it, we actually use it to enhance the prediction to drive what the final decision is. And so um, this is how we've had the opportunity to apply um, the availability of a vast data set, sort of big data, and in this tight window of time that is, again, it's a very unique challenge that we have in emergency medicine. And I think we have an opportunity to teach the rest of the AI community in healthcare about how this can be really powerful, but uh, nobody needs it as much as we do. So I'm hoping others that are out there listening to this presentations, if, that this is getting your wheels spinning to how to apply this in your own work to other disease processes that have very similar emergency timely care needs for diagnosis and intervention. And so, uh, in our work, um, we are in many ways doing a head-to-head -head comparison of performance between our statistical inference approaches and machine learning to learn, but also doing this in a way to optimize for balancing the variance that's out there between models, but also um, reducing bias that can be introduced with uh, models. We're, use, uh, we're using multi-center data that's from several institutions, which can be very messy and complicated logistically, but I think it's really getting us closer to finding something generalizable for emergency care. And so um, I think we've moved, at least in my career, from having medical record um, offices where you run down, you got an old chart to run back up to the ED and get an old EKG, which is what I did as a med student. I was the EKG runner at times, to bringing that to the bedside. So now we often had access to medical records on their phones, on tablets, or on computers that are at the bedside, much better than we were doing when I was a med student. Um, and we now are really trying to figure out how to move that, move that computing into moments or encounters where decisions need to be made with the information that's available in those fast systems. And so that's where this next step comes into, into play. How do we build critical decision support to augment, to lift our hand up the way that hand was sort of doing in partnership with the human? Um, when we are in the moment of needing to make a decision, how do we bring that data to us? So a lot of the work we're doing in this space is really um, taking the predictive model that's worked uh, on historical data sets and actually implementing it into the electronic health record system, the computer, and having it drive decisions for us to compare with what's actually happening in practice. So the first thing that we're doing is looking at model translation fidelity. How does that translate from a historical data set on my computer um, or my server to uh, the live care environment? Is it a one-to-one -one translation? And when it's not, why? Is there missing this with the live care data that's not representing historical data sets? Is it just not picking up data in a timely fashion that's within our window despite us thinking it might? And the last is efficacy and safety. So a lot of what we, um, pursue when we're having interventions of drugs and devices into medical care. We're applying that same framework to artificial intelligence algorithms being inserted into clinical care. Um, so the way that we're working on this is really looking at our workflow for arriving a patient, what's happening in the electronic medical record system and how the clinical decision is being made through this interface. And so I'll just kind of walk you through this so you can see how this decision support would work step by step. So first we have our EHR user activity. So our intake staff member initiates the generation of a new emergency department encounter for an arriving patient. So Mr. Jones walks up and 
Sally, who's there at the desk says, Mr. Jones, what are you here for today? Says, I don't feel very well. I'm having difficulty breathing. So she starts to arrive, at, uh, arrive. Mr. Jones in the emergency department brings up this field and starts typing. So that's intake activity that's now happening. Mr. Jones and Sally are together. She's typing in the computer system. She enters his information to fill out these fields. That information is being continuously exposed to the clinical decision support algorithm that's running within the electronic health record that she's interfacing with. That data is acquired. Um, uh, it's then dynamically sent and translated using our logic model into a decision. That data is interpreted and that decision is then fed back into the system. Now, if no EKG is, is indicated, then nothing happens. Now, all this stuff has happened, but in terms of how it affects the workflow, nothing happens. However, if there, the patient should get an EKG per this calculation that's made by the computer, um, this decision support tool, that will then push the alert we spoke of onto Sally's screen that says this patient needs an early EKG. Now, what would then happen is that um, uh, Sally would then, her workflow would be to request an early EKG and then she would wait for a direct handoff to staff member attack this page in order to um, uh, hand the patient off for that early EKG that is hopping the queue of typical care process that's because they're getting the test before they see a physician. And so um, we're doing this in a prospective cohort in the emergency department. Um, but the CDS decisions won't affect care at this phase. And so if I can go back to the slide, we're not using this blue pathway, these three boxes. We're actually stopping at the step because we really want to study what happens from the decisions made here that are then fed back into the electronic health record system um, versus what is happening in usual care without the interference of the system. So how is the human performing and how would the computer perform? And how do they match up to see if the opportunity we identified and the work I showed you early on in this presentation match up? So um, again, much like artificial, we consider artificial intelligence and in our work to be like a new drug or device being introduced into practice. We want to study the comparative effectiveness to our current practice of human versus computer. And so our first step is really fidelity testing. As I mentioned, is it one to one? How does a predictive model perform like in a data set versus we're going to pull the same data set from that prospective cohort, run our model. And then we're going to see what the CDS identified, and then we're going to look at what actually happened in clinical care. And then lastly, we're examining the efficacy and safety. So observed care, what actually happened, comparing to the CDS identification. And when there's a difference, really trying to understand, like, when, when did we in the computer not agree? And how do we understand what was different there? Um, was there human, were there human interaction issues going on? Was there um, a lot of drama happening in the waiting room with the patient, with the staff? Was the ED busy? Um, and really that helps us understand, um, we're hoping the model and believe models likely to perform better than clinical practice given the evidence I showed you before, but really understanding when they're different is gonna help us augment and optimize the system, um, optimize the model in order to have it perform ideally before this goes live. And so in summary, what we have done in many cases is try to do with the aid of computing, what we have set out to do in emergency medicine from the day our specialty was born, which is get the right care at the right time. And I would say not for the right patient, but for every patient. And in this case, we've identified a life-threatening condition that has a time-limited intervention where if we miss the timely care targets, we have nothing to offer many of these patients. And they're at a higher risk for poor outcomes and increased mortality. So how do we go and back engineer how care can be better on the front end at the point of patient presentation to use the patient data we have already, to have risk prediction via replicating physician decision-making by augmenting our model, because we know what we're doing already is pretty limited, translating that into risk prediction, that risk prediction to clinical decision support, and, aug and then testing that prediction against usual care to then help us make this decision, should they get an e early EKG, and if it's a STEMI, get to treatment, or no, they are okay and they are safe to wait for physician evaluation. And so um, wish us luck on this journey, but I hope that this pathway has also, um, again, inspired others to think about how this might be applied in the work. So I'll say that um, our next step in our science is really a randomized controlled or step wedge clinical trial of EHR predictive models, this EHR predictive model supported STEMI screening in the form of clinical decision support. Um, I list here many of our collaborators who've done some of this preliminary work that I've shared with you already. Many of you who are listening to this presentation might be friends and colleagues in the emergency medicine research community that have been part of this preliminary work. This is not a one person show. This is us in emergency medicine identifying when we have a challenge and uniting the limitations and also the strengths of all of our practice environments in order to come towards a solution. And so 
Um, as your wheels are spinning, hopefully now, and, um, and also as you're reading the literature and following how AI is emerging into the space of emergency medicine, there are many places where there are applications emerging that are currently touching our practice. So all of this work involves interdisciplinary partnerships with folks who are not emergency care clinicians, who um, are ready with their skills to, to be able to apply them to our use case. And so if you're looking for where you as an emergency care researcher or as an emergency physician who might be starting to get thinking about research, can have an opportunity to offer something new to our, special, to our practice and into science. It's really providing the well-crafted use case that you're going to know from your experience being the person at the bedside in the ED and having trained for a long period of time to do that work. So the interdisciplinary partnerships that I'm involved in with biomedical informatics specialists and the growing community of applied clinical informaticists, they are able to bring their skills to our table to help us explore applications of AI in emergency care. So just a few that you're gonna hear about or probably are already hearing about. One is identifying the rare patient that has a STEMI using past medical records, registration, and demographic and um, chief complaint data. In addition, um, analyzing variation and radiologic imaging to identify abnormal findings. And there's a lot of work being done here uh, in the space of pulmonary embolism, but also for cancer, specifically um, nodules that are found on CT scans for the chest done for other purposes and using the characteristics, the anatomical characteristics in 2D and 3D to see what is predictive of something that might evolve into a future cancer. And then lastly, predicting elderly patients with features that are predictive of traumatic falls. So recognizing their patterns of subsequent visits that if they're present for a provider, for a patient that uh, might trigger an intervention to lose health, home safety evaluations or um, frailty uh, interventions to improve conditioning and to reduce risk. And so with that, I'll end this presentation on a framework for artificial intelligence and emergency medicine. Um, it's, I, again, my hope that this has inspired some thoughts as to where we move forward. And with that, uh, with our live audience here, for those of you who are live, we'll um, open this up for any questions on what's been presented so far or some ideas. Thank you for that incredible presentation. I know that so many of our colleagues are going to really benefit from reviewing this recording several times. Okay. Yeah, wonderful. So my question comes in in regards to gender data bias. So as a clinician, I know that the research is so much more extensive when a man comes in with a STEMI compared to when a woman comes in with a STEMI, her symptoms are different. And we just have blind spots even to what those symptom clusters look like or what her experience was because the research has just been so much more extensive in men. How do you think that even lack of research and data bias affects the models when they're aggregating you know, all genders together as opposed to one model that predicts for male patients and another model for female patients? This has been a question that we've fielded so many times. And I think there are really two things that we're using to um, make sure that we don't exacerbate existing biases. So one is we're using a lot of existing literature that has been done in women specifically to understand what's the hierarchy for symptoms and how in women and how is that different? So what we're finding is the hierarchy is the same is the proportion of patients who have each chief complaint, uh, who have each past medical history element, that's different. So really it's the same variables, it's just the weight that each of those variables has. And so in terms of having separate models, the approach that we've taken is actually to put all of the variables into one model and to recognize that um, gender is gonna be a modifier for the weight of all the other variables. Um, we're doing work to really dig in, and this is where using machine learning has been helpful, um, trying to find predictors that we wouldn't have thought about with the knowledge that we have so far. And really taking vast data sets that are defined by what do we know within 10 minutes and saying, okay, this is the data we have available. Now go look at all of that and tell us about what we don't know already. And I think that's where the power of machine learning can help us overcome our clinical knowledge and historical literature biases. And there are many for who's included in studies, who's included in trials, who was given interventions. They're all things that we know um, have not favored women, have not favored non-whites, have not favored diabetics, have not favored the very young and the very old. And so recognizing that, really saying, taking a humble approach and letting the power of big data anal uh, analytics help us to learn more about um, what we have, as opposed to just pushing forward what we know. 
Um, and so I think in a lot of this work, you know, it's, you know, I didn't learn machine learning in medical school or in residency, or quite frankly, when I did my master's of science in clinical investigation, but it's something that I've invested a lot of time exploring and learning from collaborators because I think the power for our clinical practice is so great for all the reasons that you mentioned. Thank you so much. I look forward to the results of your ongoing work. Great Thank talk. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. And happy okay. to take well, uh, thank you, Dr. Yadam, for this uh, very, very informative presentation. Uh, I think that's going to be our final question for today. Uh, thank you to everyone watching uh, this presentation for the SAEM Research Learning Series. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone.